hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Coral Reef Webinar Month. I'm Jessica Price, and tonight I'm here to present Marine Invertebrate Identification Part 1. So thank you for joining me. Each April, the Coral Reef Conservation Program from uh, the Department of Environmental Protection hosts Earth Month classes to teach folks about the wonderful creatures that inhabit Florida's coral reef. So although we can't see you in person this month, we're really excited to offer a web series um, and reach even more people than we normally would if it was in a classroom. Uh, this is our schedule for the month. You can see that we have webinars pretty much every Tuesday and Thursday till the end of April. And I would like to draw your attention to Tuesday, April 12th. That is the Marine Invertebrate Identification Part 2 webinar. So that's going to be a continuation of the presentation I uh, start this evening. So make sure you add that one to your calendar for sure. Thank you again for tuning in. Everyone in this webinar is currently muted. So I ask that you type um, any questions that you might have in the chat or raise your hand. I'm going to have some tech support with me and we're going to get to as many questions as we can. And there's going to be a few minutes after each um, group to go through those questions. All right, so just to give you a little bit of background about me, as I said, my name is Jessica and I work at the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in Miami, where this lovely star is. And I'm in the Coral Reef Conservation Program and I act as the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Coordinator. So my team and I work to promote education and awareness of coral reef habitats, and we focus on ways to avoid damaging the reefs. So um, little things such as using a mooring buoy instead of anchoring. And then unfortunately, if damage does occur, we enforce the Coral Reef Protection Act that was established in 2009, making it illegal to anchor on hard bottom substrate in uh, Southeast Florida. And then as I said, I have some awesome tech support who will assist uh, with all the questions. Taylor, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Tucker and I also work in our reef injury prevention and response team. So I'm located in our West Palm office at the Southeast District and thank you everyone for coming today, super excited. Great, thank you. So before we get to the star of the show, first we need to mention the Florida Reef Track or as we now call it, Florida's Coral Reef which is represented by the hot pink outline in this image above. Um, the reef extends 350 miles from St. Lucie Inlet in Martin County, all the way past the Keys down into the Dry Tortugas. So for reference, that's the same length as driving from Miami to Jacksonville. That is not a quick trip. Florida's reef is closely related to and often referred to as a barrier reef. However, it lacks those shallow inshore lagoons that you see um, and like in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So we actually call it a barrier bank reef. I would also like to point out um, this kind of a, a universal statistic that a lot of people in the scientific community know, but it's always important. Globally, coral reefs make up less than 1% of the ocean, but they house 25% of all species. So reefs are a large amount of diversity and a very small area, and Florida's coral reef is no different. So while the reef changes as it moves um, throughout its length and the type of diversity you have, um, there, there is really an amazing amount of animal and plant diversity. They're essentially cities of the ocean. Uh, and if you need like a visual reference in your mind for this, just think of uh, an animated movie. So Finding Nemo or like Shark Tale, their description of the reef is pretty accurate. They're big cities. But it's human nature to ask why should we care? Reefs are pretty, but why are they important to the average Joe? Well, if you're tuning in from outside of Florida and not aware, Southeast Florida is a highly developed coastline. You can tell by just looking at this middle image right here. We have over 6 million people that live in Southeast Florida and 38 million people that visit annually. And this is actually an older statistic. That number has grown substantially in the last couple of years. And Florida's coral reef is the first line of defense and vital to shoreline protection to this um, you know, city. And they do this by reducing wave action up to 90% and storm surges um, and flooding that occur during tropical storms and hurricanes. So it's very important that we have this reef offshore. In addition to the reef providing this um, 
biodiversity and ecological benefits such as shoreline protection. It provides Florida with a $6 billion industry and over 71,000 jobs. And jobs um, include fishing, diving, and boating relating activities. This economy simply would not be possible without the reef system. All right, so let's get into the star of the show tonight, the marine invertebrates. Everybody cheers, I know. So tonight I'm gonna cover what do we mean when we say invertebrate and why should we care about these animals? We'll walk through a very simplified phylogeny of the animal kingdom, showing parts of the tree of life. And then the bulk of the course is gonna be identification of Florida common critters um, in the phyla periphera, cnidaria, tenophore, and platyhelminthes. And if those words mean nothing to you, no problem. I really hope that at the end, you'll know a little bit more about them, if not more than you want it to know. And then at the very end, we're gonna do a very rigorous, very difficult quiz. Just kidding. All right, so invertebrates are animals that neither possess nor develop a backbone. And that is all animals except for those in the subphylum vertebrata. And the vertebrates are fish, amphibian, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So 97% of all species are invertebrates. It's kind of crazy to think about. Sadly, um, vertebrates get all the attention. And this is especially true when it comes to conservation. And I understand, you know, um, elephants and rhinos, they're larger animals. Um, they're often easy to put on television because they don't like to live in cracks and crevices like many invertebrates. But the invertebrates are still important. And many species of invertebrates are vital to maintaining ecosystems in uh, the coral reef. Examples of this are nutrient cycling and then also, also often being the base of the food chain. So today I'm hoping to teach you guys some cool facts about invertebrates and why you should be excited to see them on the reef. Now, when we talk about phylogenetic trees and organizing animals, we look kind of at the evolution of, an of the animal. So if two animals have the same feature, it's likely that they had a common ancestor at one point that had the same feature. So for instance, if we go back to the subphylum vertebrata, it's more likely that those of that group, such as mammals and birds, all had a common ancestor with a backbone, opposed to each one of those groups developing a backbone separately and independently. And this is common of what we see in elev um, sorry, evolution, but this is not always true. So in some cases, the same feature is developed independently. And a cool example of that is bats and birds. So both developed wings to help fly, but they did it independently of each other. So if you picture a bat, their wings are uh, essentially an arm, like a human arm, from the elbow down with their skin around it. And you know, they have a wrist, they have essentially finger bones, opposed to a bird, which is kind of like, for reference, if you looked at your shoulder and then went down to your elbow, and then there's feathers extending off of it. So each of them developed these wings for flight, but they did it independently and they're in different phyla. All right, so this is a very simple tree of life. Uh, and we're just gonna go through it a little bit. And we all started with the protozoans. So we have sponges, cnidarians, which are your jellyfish, sea anemones, and hydras, tenophores, Flatworms, which are tapeworms and flukes. Roundworms, which include the hookworms. Mollusks, which include clams and snails. Annelids, which are gonna be your more complex worms, such as leeches and earthworms. Arthropods, which include the insects and spiders. Echinoderms, which include sea urchins and sea cucumbers. And then the chordates, which are the um, subphylum vertebrata, again, with the fish, mammals, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, fish, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. So as you can see, there's a huge diversity of invertebrates and only one little group of vertebrates. Today, we're gonna cover the invertebrates at the base of the tree of life. So we're gonna look at the sponges, cnidarians, tenophores, and flatworms. 
as I said, um, on April 12th, there is going to be a part two to this presentation, and it's going to be presented by the amazing Mauricio. So again, make sure you turn, tune in for that. <clears throat> so we're going to start with the sponges. These are animals in the phyla periphera, which means pore bearers. Sponges are the simplest multicellular animal and comprise the first branch of the evolutionary tree. So this makes them a common answer, ancestor of all the other animal phyla. Also a fun fact, the branch of zoology that studies sponges is spongiology, which is just a fun word to say. <laughs> sponges are essentially a collection of individual, relatively independent cells working in concert to form an organism. This independence is you unique to peripherates. So if you compare that to human cells that are always working closely together to help us function, it's really it's really cool that they work independently. The cells form no true tissue layers or organs. Sponges don't have a, a circulatory system or a nervous system, but they have a, some method of coordinating certain activities. If you've ever seen a sponge buried out on the reef by sand or any sort of sediment, they can contract together to remove that in um, almost like a sneeze. And it's uh, it's pretty awesome to, to watch. I recommend if you have some time, just going on YouTube and looking at that. Now, sponges are very common on Florida's coral reef and they're one of my favorite phyla. And as you can see from the images on the screen, they come in several different colors, shapes, um, sizes, and they can be found in different habitats. Can anyone guess in the chat just really quickly how many species of sponge that we have uh, in Florida? All right, for those of you who put 80, you are correct. Um, that number might be a little bit higher now. There are over 7,000 species described globally, but it's estimated that the total number of species is closer to 15,000. And it's tricky to classify sponges because there are so many, um, there are many species that vary in shape, size, and color, and it's actually just one species. So on top of that, they can also grow in different habitats and have a different shape based on what habitat they're growing in. There are some sponges that will be closer to shore and be more of an encrusting shape, but when you get further offshore, they actually kind of look a um, more tube shape or pillar shape. Needless to say, it can be difficult for scientists to classify sponges. But don't worry, today I'm going to focus on common Florida sponges that are easy to recognize and do not have huge variation. Oh, and just one final note, um, they're a great food source for fish, turtles, and sea slugs, and they also provide a lot of habitat. It's something that, uh, People think of corals when they think of habitat out on our reef, and the sponges actually provide a, a huge amount of habitat as well. So the surface of a sponge is perforated with those small pores, again, why they get their name. Water is gonna be drawn in through these pores and pumped through the interior by a, almost like a whip. And it's an extension on the cells called flagella. And those cells are coanocytes. And if you look at the images, and I'll break down what each one of these are in a second, but you'll see this red outline within each one of them, and that's the coanocytes. So when water is drawn in, as it passes through the sponge, food and nutrients are filtered out. Um, and then like fresh water, well, not fresh water, but um, essentially clean water exits the body cavity through an osculum. And these images on the screen are the organization types of sponge um, shapes. So you have the ascon, which is the sponge of the simplest structure. It's the least common. It's often a vase. It has um, numerous small openings where water can be drawn in, but it only has one osculum. Next is sicon, which is more complex. They do have dermal pores that are made from the wall, the folded walls where water can be drawn in 
but it still only has that one osculum at the top. And leucon is the most complex of sponges, but it's also the most common. So they have uh, more complex dermal pores and an internal chamber and multiple osculum and exits. Now on this next slide, it's gonna be a video, video that represents that uh, process I was telling you about how the sponge can draw in water. And it's, it's kind of a short video, so I just kind of wanna explain what's happening before I switch over. It's a bunch of uh, researchers on, on the reef, they're diving and they have this dye and you may have seen a similar video, they're kind of common now. And what they do is they release this dye in the water column near the sponges and the dye is completely harmless. So it's not gonna do any damage to the reef. And what you'll see is that um, water with the dye that being drawn in through the sponge and then expelled through the osculum. So hopefully it plays. Everybody is seeing this right now. So as I said, they're releasing that dye and you can almost immediately see the sponge expel the, the dye out through the osculum. It's a really fascinating process to actually be able to witness. All right, so the first sponge that we're gonna talk about tonight is the giant barrel sponge or Zesto spongia muta. They're sometimes called the redwoods of the reef because they grow very large, up to several meters, and they can be very old. Uh, I believe the oldest one that was dated uh, uh, several years ago was a barrel sponge in Curacao that was dated around 2,300 years old. So that's actually older than the redwoods in California. Now this sponge is barrel shaped with thick, thick walls. Their color, it tends to be purple to red brown externally, and then they tend to be a little bit lighter um, on the inside, more of a tan color. Uh, you can't really see it too well in these images, but they are a little bit lighter inside. And then the surface has round or blade-like outlines, and then their consistency tends to be brittle or crumbly. They're located in the mid reef range to um, deep coral reefs. So usually deeper than 10 meters. And they're also often found on steep slopes as um, you know, the reef drops off. As I said, these are very, very large sponges. Their osculum is often large enough for a person to fit through. Um, please don't do that, but just for reference and size, it can be quite large. Um, the tissues of the sponge do contain a symbiotic cyano cyanobacteria, which helps them feed, but it also makes them susceptible to bleaching in a similar mechanism that uh, corals struggle with. So when they bleach, the symbiote leaves um, and their tissue will actually turn white. These bleaching events are not really understood. We're still doing a lot of research uh, in that regard but they do tend to take place in the warm summer months, similar to how coral can bleach with the warmer temperature, water temperatures. Barrel sponges are also great habitats for other reef organisms, such as fish, crabs, and shrimp. And you can just see by this, uh, these images, the assortment of diversity of the organisms that live within these sponges. One thing I would like to point out is that cystospongia appear to be particularly susceptible to damage by marine debris or um, reef inter user interaction. The tissue of this species is non-elastic and slices very easily. It's something that uh, unfortunately we see with our reef injury and prevention assessments is that uh, vessel anchor chains will swing across the reef and they'll actually slice portions of these sponges. Thankfully, as long as they're not sliced all the way to the base, they can um, regrow, but the sliced off portions, unfortunately, cannot reattach. All right, the next sponge is one of my personal favorites, Cleona Delatrix, which is the red boring sponge. They are an encrusting sponge and they get their name because they produce a corrosive substance that allows them to tunnel 
or bore, hence their name, into hard substrates like rocks, coral skeletons, or mollusk shells. And basically, they end up breaking down the calcium car, car oh, wow, words. They break down the calcium substrate beneath. And this is just a close-up image of these sponges and just a few helpful ID tips. You'll notice that they have several raised osculum. You'll see that right here in the middle of the image on the left. And the osculum tend to have a network of what looks like caves inside. They're also a vivid red-orange color. They're very hard to miss once they're on the reef. Um, and you can also see the small pores that help draw in the water. And yes, oops, we went backwards. All right, so what makes Cleona really cool, but is kind of unfortunate, is a trait of the species is its competition with corals. So in these photos, you can see the boring sponge aggressively overgrowing live coral. We don't really know why they um, act in competition with the coral. Likely it's because if a coral is there, then there's plenty of nutrients and light that would benefit the sponge as well. But essentially what is happening is the, the sponge bores into the substrate next to the coral and they engage in a chemical warfare. And unfortunately, this does oftentimes kill the coral and take over that colony. And how long it takes to take to take over the colony and end up killing the coral just really depends on the coral health. But it's still a very cool process. All right, the last sponge that I have for you tonight is Aplastenia californis, or the red poor rope sponge. They are long and rope-like with a porous, somewhat rough texture. And as you can see from the image on the left, they're often in tangled messes. And they're usually found hanging from ledges. They can grow up to six feet in length. And sometimes in the past, they've been confused as a um, octocoral or a soft coral. They resemble some sea rods. But the main difference in the way to distinguish between the two of them is that uh, if you look on the image on the right, and you kind of look really close, you can see those porous structures um, on the sponge. And then also you can see the raised osculum, where opposed to a sea rod, which would be covered in um, very distinct polyps. Oh my goodness. OK, so often the sponge has inhabitants of brittle stars and zoanthids. And then this sponge is really cool because it's found to have anti-human immunodeficiency virus properties, so HIV properties, that make it really important for um, medical research, something that benefits us. All right. So that's the last sponge that I have. Does anybody have any questions that they want to put in the chat or in the question box? Uh, the only question that we've had so far is if this session is going to be recorded and we are recording it and it will be shared um, after the session is over. So thank you. But that's the only question that um, we have seen so far. Okay, thanks, Taylor. All right, so next up we have the Nidarians. So what makes a cnidarian a cnidarian? What connects these three different um, organisms? They all look very different. So what connects them? Well, cnidarians have, a, have specialized stinging cells called cnidocytes, and within them they have a um, structure called nematocytes. Also, cnidarians are, um, have two life stages. So a medusa stage, which is the free swimming, or a polyp stage, which is affixed to a substrate. And these three different organisms, we'll go into more detail in a little bit, but they're each representative um, of those different life stages. So the one up on the left is the polyp stage. 
they just stay fixed to the substrate. The one on the right, the jelly, is the medusa stage, free swimming. And then the fire coral at the base is actually both. It has both life stages. And I'll go into more detail in a second. All right, so this is a close up and, um, and drawn image of those stinging structures called nematocytes. And you can think of them as envenomated spring loaded harpoons. So they'll fire on physical contact. The animal itself has no control over releasing these stinging cells. They get no cue from the animal itself. So that's what makes tentacles of a dead jellyfish on the beach still dangerous. <laughs> so we're gonna go over several different groups of cnidarians. First, we have the cubozoa, which are the box jellies. Skyphozoa, which are the true jellies. Anthozoa, which are corals and anemones. And hydrozoa which are the fire corals and the Portuguese man of war. And note that I am saying jelly instead of jellyfish because in the scientific community, we're really trying to get away from saying jellyfish since these organisms have nothing to do with fish. All right, so first up are the box jellies. They're also called sea wasps. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them because they're rarely found on reefs. And there's only four species within the Caribbean. And only one of those species is found in Florida. And it's actually found in Boca in mangrove habitats. So you're not likely to come across it. But these jellies are tiny, about the size of your fingernail. And they do get a lot of bad press because people and animals, unfortunately, um, will come in contact with them and they may experience paralysis, cardiac arrest, or even death. And this usually happens within a few minutes of being stung. Um, but of the 50 or so species of box jellies in the world, only a few are of that are link, lethal. And I want to clarify, again, none of them are in the Caribbean. Those species are in the Pacific. So if you're in Florida, cool. If you're in Australia, you could be a little worried. Um, the box jelly also have traits that set them apart from other jellies. Most notably, they can swim. Most true jellies or the Portuguese man of war do not, cannot really control their locomotion. And we'll go into a little bit more of that in a minute, but the box jelly can move at maximum speeds of about four knots, which is cool. Um, also, they have a cluster of eyes on each side of their box. So some of the eyes are actually pretty sophisticated with a lens and cornea, and then an iris that can contract in bright light and a retina. So scientists believe with their speed and vision that they actively hunt their prey. So, and their prey tend to be shrimp and small fish. All right, next up are the Skyphozoa, or the true jellies. They're very common on Florida's coral reef. And these jellies have no durable hard parts, including no head, no skeleton, and no specialized organs for respiration or excursion. Marine jellies can consist of 98% water. They do, however, have a ring of muscle fibers around the rim of their dome or belt depending on who you ask and what that's called. Um, the jelly swims by alternating, and contracting and relaxing their muscles. So they're not really swimming. They're kind of, they have a little bit of control, but they're not actively swimming. So they're considered plankton. Most true jellies are gonochoristic, which means they have separate male and female sexes. However, in addition to that sexual reproduction, they, uh, many species can reproduce asexually too, by just kind of butting off a little clone. All right. So the first jelly we're gonna talk about tonight is the moon jelly. And it's one of the most common jellies you'll see. 
It's named for its moon-like shape and translucent white color. This jelly is found in our waters from April to early November, and it kind of depends a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of variation in that timeline, and it depends on water temperature and ocean currents. Adults are the Medusa stage or free swimming stage that I mentioned earlier when we were, we were on that, that first slide. A moon jelly's tentacles are short and they're located around the edge of its disc-shaped body, um, which as I said, is referred to as a bell or a dome. Let me see if I can turn on this spotlight here. Yeah, cool. So they are a little bit translucent, so it's hard to see, but these little, what looks like frills are actually their tentacles. Yes. And then they have four frilly arms that hang down from underneath its body. And that's what these images are up here in the top right. I hope everybody can see the spotlight here. Yes. And a fun fact about these, um, this species as these arms will be distinctly pink during August or September because they'll have a large number of larvae developing on the edge of this umbrella. So that's what this image is down here below. It's all pink. All right, so if you look at the moon jelly from above, you'll see four horseshoe shapes, which are the portions of its reproductive system. So the image on the right is kind of similar to the image we were just looking at on the previous screen. So you can see that pink translucent color implying that they're developing larvae. Now moon jellies can grow up to a foot in diameter and their favorite food, or I'm sorry, they're the favorite food of mahi-mahi and turtles. So this is why it's really important to not litter plastic bags because out on the reef and the ocean, turtles will think that they're coming up on a jelly, such as a moon jelly, um, and then accidentally ingest a plastic bag, which a lot of turtles die from, unfortunately. And then one last note about them, their tentacles are mildly toxic to humans and can cause stinging and rashes on bare skin. But as I showed you in the previous slide, their tentacles are short, so you have to kind of run right into them to be stung. Ah, yes, one of my other favorite animals, the upside down jelly. They're a flattened disc-like bell with branch oral arms, and they're usually a yellowish brown um, to white, or I'm sorry, yellowish brown color with white markings. And they live in shallow sand flats in back reefs and lagoons. They're really cool because they have 40 mini mouth openings along their mouth arm, but they don't have a central mouth. So if you go back to the moon jelly, you'll see that in the, in the center, they have kind of a centralized mouth. The upside down jelly doesn't. They just use these tiny uh, mini mouths to constantly feed. Now they're commonly seen resting on the bottom with their oral arms pointed up. And this is because they have zooxanthellae in their tissue. And when they're face up towards the sun, they can photosynthesize that way. And that's how they get most of their nourishment, which is similar to corals. Um, and then this relationship with the algae allows the jelly to live in oxygen poor environments, which is why you often see them in mangroves, estuaries, bays. I mean, I've seen them you know, at the edge of a boat ramp <laughs> where people are constantly launching boats all day long, not the cleanest environment, um, but they're very common there. If you touch these guys, they'll produce a mild sting um, but mainly it's more of um, it itches more than it stings and then the last thing i'll mention about them is that they can quote unquote swim um, but like i said the jellies don't really have a lot of control over their their movement so when i say swim i mean they can kind of get up into the water column and drift to a new spot if their previous area had been disturbed. So as I mentioned, you know, sometimes you see them by boat ramps. If somebody comes in and stirs up a lot of sediment, then they might move to a area, a different area. 
All right. <laughs> so next up, we have the anthozoa, which are going to be the corals and anemones. So we're not going to be covering corals here today because they have their own um, individual webinar that's going to be occurring in the next couple of weeks. But I did want to show you some pretty pictures because corals are awesome. Um, and also, I just want to note that these corals are the base of the reef. Their calcium carbonate skeletons are what create the ha habitats for other invertebrates. And they give the, the reef the three-dimensional structure that end up being, you know, again, habitats for invertebrates, habitats for fish. Corals are complex and they're vital to our reefs. So please tune in in a couple of weeks for the Stony ID Coral class. Taylor will be giving that one, so it'll be a good one. All right, so next up we have the sea fans, which are soft corals or octocorals. And there are several differences between soft corals and hard corals, but the easiest way to distinguish between the two is the soft corals don't produ produce that calcium carbonate structure, but they do provide um, habitat for other reef organisms. And they're also a major part of our local reefs. Florida's coral reef sees a lot of octocorals or soft corals, specifically the Gorgonian, which is the image, the images you see right now. This is uh, commonly called the sea fan. And they often are in shallow habitats and they push it, position themselves into the current so that they can pick out all available nutrients without ever having to really try. <laughs> Um, so sometimes you'll see them moving back and forth with wave action if it's in a shallow environment or they'll just be oriented so that they're maximizing um, nutrient collection from the current. Now, if you see them and you're in a shallow reef, you can just kind of watch them move back and forth. That can be very calming. It's, uh, it's relaxing to watch them underwater. Um, as I said, plenty of organisms live on and around them, such as uh, crabs, worms, and snails. And those are uh, organisms that will be touched on in Mauricio's presentation in a few weeks. And I think the most common um, associated snail is the flamingo tongue. You often see them on the fan uh, feeding around the Gorgonian specifically. All right, so next up we have Palithoa, or the white encrusting zoanthid. So anthids are not as pretty as corals, um, but we have two pictures here, both with their polyps closed, and so you're not actually seeing tentacles. They can sometimes be mistaken for certain coral or sponge species because of this colonial formation. And while they are cnidarians and they do have those stinging cells um, inside, they don't form the same skeleton so that corals do, they just encrust over dead corals or rocks. Polyps usually are oblong shaped with almost like deep, deep cavern look to them. Um, so if you're ever questioning whether it's a zoanthid or a coral, you can kind of look at the polyp um, and if it looks deep and empty, chances are it's a zoanthid and you won't see the tentacle. Um, but if you see the polyp looks full then and there's tentacles present, then it's probably a coral. And this species has kind of popped up um, and become more frequent on our reefs recently. So people have asked in the past if they're actually competing with corals, but I think they're mainly just opportunistic. You know, the our corals are unfortunately under a lot of stressors and They've been struggling in the last couple of decades. And these poly, polythoa have just taken advantage of that available space. So they're not out competing the corals per se, they're just taking advantage of the fact that the corals aren't doing great. Now, this genus of zoanthid is known to produce a toxin called uh, palioxin. So if you have an aquarium at home and you handle these guys, please be careful. This toxin won't do any damage to us personally, but it can kill the other organisms in your tank, which would be really sad. <laughs> All 
All right, so next we have the giant anemone, and they are the closest relative of corals. Giant anemones, like the one that's shown here, are generally found in crevices of rocks well, um, and attached to any hard object that it can, it can be attached to. Their main goal, though, is to be in an area of full strength seawater in a high current area where there's a lot of water flow. And you'll notice if you look at these images that they have lavender tips. The lavender tips of their tentacles are packed with those nematocytes or stinging cells, and they use them for uh, defense from other organisms and then also in feeding. So as their prey swim by or drift by, depending if it's plankton or not, um, they'll paralyze it with the nematocytes in these in the tentacles. This organism feeds on fish, mussels, shrimp, zooplankton, and sea worms. And it's also interesting to note that they can move really slowly if necessary to try to find a better food source or hunting ground. And it's also really cool that they've been in turf wars with other anemones. So they'll just sit down next to each other to see who can get the most food and then eventually one of them will move. Now, they're about the size of uh, an open hand of an adult, and their tentacles can be six to seven inches long. And they're really pretty to look at on the reef. All right, so next we have the corkscrew anemone. They get their name from, it's about 200 translucent tentacles, which are ringed with spirals that are packed with um, nidocytes, so the stinging cells. And this species has a symbiotic algae living in its tissue, which allows it to photosynthesize. Um, and that's how they get the majority of their nutrition, but they can also get nutrition from catching prey, which is mostly zooplankton or other small invertebrates. And the cool fact about them is that in addition to sexual reproduction, this species can reproduce via uh, petal laceration. So what that means is their basal disc, which is the base of the anemone, can just split and move away from one another. So it just breaks apart and like, bye, I'm gonna go live over here. Um, and you know, they both thrive as individual, um, as independent individuals. Now, corkscrew anemones also live in cracks in coral rubble or hard straits, substrates. And if you see them out on the reef, chances are you're not going to see, again, the whole anemone. You're going to see what's in these two pictures right here. So you're going to see just, just tentacles hanging out. Um, and that's how they snag their food, too. You know, something will float by or swim by, and they'll just snag it out of the, the water column. All right, and the last group we have in the Cnidarians is the Hydrozoa. And first up in that is fire coral, which is a, is a misleading name um, because they have nothing to do with fire and they're not actually coral. They kind of look like branching coral, I'll give you that. Um, and they do have painful stings, so maybe that's where they get the fire name from. I think it has more to do with their coloration, but you know, it could be. And they do build a skeleton, but it's brittle and it crumbles very easily. So it's not as durable as the true coral skeletons. Unlike true corals, fire coral polyps are nearly microscopic and they're mostly embedded in the skeleton. So if you look really closely in these images, you can kind of see the pores. Um, but really the only reason you can notice them is because there's tentacles sticking out. And Millipora, which is their genus name, literally means a thousand pores, which is kind of cool. Fire coral also house uh, algae symbiotes, and they can capture tiny prey. But they just, they look really sharp. All right, and finally, we have the siphonophores. So if you've seen these guys out on the beach, you might think, hey, they're a jelly, right? Nope, 
They are actually not. This is the Portuguese man o' war, and it's a colonial animal made up of four distinct specialized polyps that work in concert um, to make the organism like a whole organism. And the way I remember this and how I taught myself when I did uh, my taxonomy course is I thought of Power Rangers. So if you're a 90s kid and you watch Power Rangers, the Portuguese man o' war is essentially a megazoid. Like they all are individuals and then they come together to make this one cool organism. Now the four specialized polyps are called the nematophore, which is the gas float. It's their sail, how they get their name. Um, and it's, yeah, a gas filled float. Then we have the gastroid, which is how they uh, feed, and the gonad, I cannot say that word, gonadendron, which is their um, reproduction, um, used for reproduction. And then finally, we have the tentacular papillon, which are the tentacles. And none of these can live without the other. Their locomotion is wind-driven, which is why they often end up stranded on the beaches and why we um, need to be careful when we see them on the beach. Because as I said, those nematocytes are um, activated by physical touch, not a cue from the animal. So if a Portuguese man on the war has been on the beach for a week, it might actually still sting you if you come up and touch it. So don't be like the kid on TikTok recently who licked one. Now their tentacles can be 10 feet long. I haven't seen this personally, um, but there are reports of it. All right. Now that's all I have for the Nidarians. Does anybody have any questions at the moment? Hey Jess, yeah, we have a couple questions in the chat. So the first one was, how do box jelly swim? So do you wanna take that one or do you want me to? I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Uh, how do box jellies swim? Do you want me to take that one? Sure. Okay, so the way that jellyfish swim is it, the action takes place in the jelly's bell, so the muscles contract to expel water, propelling the animal forward. And then box jellies are actually pretty advanced among jellyfish. And they have the ability to move rather than just drift, and they can jet up to four knots through the water, which is pretty cool. So that was the first question. And then the next one we had was, um, I'm not sure when this question came in, but someone asked, don't some people call them floating brains, essentially? So I, I haven't heard that one before. Have you, Jess? No, but that's... That's a, that's a fun nickname. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then someone also commented, yes, I've seen super long tentacles washed on shore. And then also one other one. Um, so what is the meaning of the action when Portuguese man of war, once again, when Portuguese man of war move once they're beached on shore? You mean, how do we um, dispose of them? That's what I'm Maybe. thinking. And the second okay. part of the question was, I understand that they have no self-propulsion in the water, but once they're washed up occasionally, I find one that is moving. Oh, um, um, so this they, Sorry, just one yeah, more they, they, they don't survive once they're out of the water. Um, uh, maybe you came across one that was recently just um, beached. So, um, and, you know, like we said, they, they can't control their locomotion. So once, once they're on the beach, they're kind of done for. Um, in regards to removing them from the beach, sometimes uh, um, the beach cleaners can assist with that. And a lot of locals sometimes will bury them in the sand, as I mentioned earlier, just kind of to make sure that nobody comes up and messes with them. And then that way they're just kind of like out of sight and not on our beach anymore, so. Yeah, any other questions? I saw something also asking about um, the session being recorded. So yes, the session will be recorded and shared. 
Okay, awesome. Well, I thank you, Taylor. Um, and I apologize, guys, this is probably gonna go just a little over an hour, so bear with me. All right, so next up we have the tinafores, which are the comb jellies. And comb jellies often get confused as true jellies because of um, how they look, but they're a small distinct phylum of marine invertebrates. They generally have two tentacles, as seen in the, the image on the left there, and they use that to trap prey, or they can have no tentacles, such as um, was it A, D, E, and F. And when they don't have any tentacles, um, they actually get their prey by enveloping them, which if we could make them larger and just physically, can you imagine like just a human walking up to another human and enveloping them? Like, sorry, I, invertebrates are so cool. Anyways, um, they lack the stinging nematocytes, which is why they're not cnidarians. So they're not gonna hurt you if you see them in the water, but their bodies are very delicate and can break apart very easily. So please do not touch them if you see them. Now, the most important visual distinction of the tinafore is the presence of the row of cilia. Um, and so similar to how sponges use uh, their flagella to filter water, the tinafores will use the cilia to filter water, but they'll use it for locomotion. So the rows of cilia in a tinafore are often called combs, which is why they get their common name of comb bears or um, you know, and a less accurate name is comb, comb jelly, but they're not actually jellies. Um, and the coordinated beating of these cilia allows the tinafore to move in the water column. However, similar to true jellies, they are considered plankton because they're not strong swimmers. So they can kind of control their movement a little bit, but not the same way that you or I could swim. Now, the rainbow color of their uh, comb rows is, I'm sorry, let me say that again. The rainbow color of their comb rows beating is not caused by bioluminescence, but rather the scattering of light as the cilia move. So essentially the cilia are moving at such a rapid pace that it's, um, it's causing diffraction. And this is a similar process that uh, creates a rainbow as light scatters through raindrops. Also, these animals do display bioluminescence at night if they're disturbed, but they can be really pretty. All right, and that's all I have for the comb jellies. Um, and we're gonna move into our last phyla, which is the flatworms. Hey, Jess, um, yeah. we have a couple more questions too. Okay, oh. so um, do you know how big uh, cineophores can get? Uh, tinafores are usually really small. Um, they are probably three to four inches in length. They're, they tend to be really small. The tentacles can get longer, um, but the individual tinafores um, are pretty small. Awesome. And then do you know at what speed the cone bears move? Ooh, that's a really good question. I actually do not know. Um, Taylor, if you take down the um, write down the name of the person, I can get back to them on that. Yeah, definitely. So any questions that you have um, that we can't answer right now, feel free to email coral at floridadep.gov. So it's coral, C-O-R-A-L at floridadep.gov and we will get back to you. So, all right, next question. Do you know how old cone bears get? That's another really good question. I apologize. I, I do not know the answer to that. Yeah. So if you could also email us that question, we will be sure to get back to you. And then um, another one here. How slash when do the individual parts of the Portuguese man of war come together to form one individual? Um, that's just kind of part of their their development stage um, as they go through that that uh, process. Um, they don't they don't really you know when i said power rangers that might have been a mistake because they don't actually come together like that that's how they develop 
So, yeah. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Jess. Right. And then um, one me, last one. Taylor, okay. I'm sorry. Let me come back to these questions in a minute and get through the rest of this presentation. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you. All right, guys, sorry. The last group is the platyhelminthes, which are the flatworms. And while the flatworms we're talking about today on the, the reef are free living, about 80% of all flatworms are parasitic. Now these worms lack specialized respiratory, skeleton, and circulatory systems. They do, however, have a nervous system and a few sensory organs in their head. Flatworms have no body cavity and no specialized circulatory or respiratory organs as well. Um, we think that the coloration that some of these vibrant reef ones have is a warning to predators that they're either poisonous or they taste terrible. Also, I want to distinguish that um, the difference between platyhelminthus or the, the flatworm and nudibranchs or sea slugs. So all of the images on the screen here are, um, are not flatworms. And they can be distinguished by the crown-shaped naked gills, as you see on the image on the left, or the uh, serrata, which are both used for gas exchange. And then um, nudibranchs also have rhinophores. So rule of thumb, if they have what looks like slightly complex appendages, it's not actually the flatworm. Now, the first worm I want to mention is the tiger flatworm. Now, despite their tiny size, which is about the size of a fingernail, they're easier to spot offshore because they're bright white with brownish black stripes and orange around the edges. Now, because of its bright coloration, it indicates that it's unappetizing with its uh, abundance of chemical compounds. So the flatworm is actually, this flatworm anyways, is rarely preyed upon. Now, a characteristic of this family is the presence of two tentacles on the head that are formed um, from folds in the interior portion of the body. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's a little tentacles on top. And as I mentioned, they are usually small, but they can get to the size of about a hand. Um, and as they grow, the edge of their body folds on itself and appears kind of frilly. And you can see this on the image on the left. Um, and sometimes when you're looking for small invertebrates, a good rule of thumb is to find what they eat. Sometimes it's easier to find what they're eating. So for example, the tiger flatworm has a predatory relationship with its only source of food, which is the orange tunicate on the right here. Um, this mangrove tunicate, um, I just wanna mention, we're not going into detail about it, but it creates a chemical E 743 and that's used as a anti-tumor medication and it also helps with uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and melanoma. So when the flatworm takes in the tunicate, it also ingests the drug. Unfortunately, um, it's not been possible to produce this drug and in order to utilize this drug and harvest it, you would have to take a massive amount of flatworms and tunicates. So right now it's not a realistic option, um, but it is something interesting to note. All right. So next we have the leopard flatworm. It's reddish brown with large orange and smaller yellow spots. There's small white spots along the edges of this one. Um, and they do have two small sensory antenna on their head. And as you can see on their body, the edges are wavy. This worm can um, get up to five centimeters. And the flatworm lives on coral reefs, but like all other invertebrates, it likes to hide beneath rocks or rubble. And then it can swim in the open using the edges of its body. 
Also, this uh, worm is found um, with a depth range from about one meter to 25 meters. And then the cool thing about this flatworm is that they can swim and they look really cool when they do it. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to add another video to this presentation, so I suggest them looking online for videos of them swimming. Uh, they, they look like a ribbon floating in the wind. All right, so tonight we covered sponges, cnidarians, tinafores, and flatworms. Um, you know, I know they're considered the most simplistic of our uh, evolutionary tree, uh, tree of life, but I hope you can appreciate now on some of their cooler adaptations and, you know, their, their awesome features and how they can kind of contribute to the reef. And again, I just want to mention that um, Mauricio is going to do uh, part two of this presentation on April 12th. So make sure you tune in for that to go over mollusks, annelids, arthropods, and echinoderms. So, all right, Taylor, I have time for probably two questions if there were any other ones that came into the chat. Yeah, awesome. Um, before we go into any questions, I just want to point out to everyone that the first webinar, Introduction to Florida's Coral Reef, was rescheduled, so it will be presented tomorrow night at 6 p.m. And that any questions that you have that we couldn't get to, please email to coral at floridadep.gov. I sent that in the chat. Um, so if you send us an email, we will get back to you with the answer. And then a couple last questions. Where do flamingo's tongue um, fall under? I don't know the answer to that one. Where do they fall under? Like I'm thinking they mean like which taxonomically thing? they're yeah. they're in the mollusks. So they're going to be covered in um, that presentation that Mauricio is going to give in a couple of weeks. And then also, um, do you know if the corkscrew anemone is invasive? I don't believe so, but I, I yeah. am not certain. I think I think they are not, but um, if you want to email us, we can definitely get back to you. And I think uh, there's one more question. Are the eye spots for vision on flatworms? Um, they have um, saying vision is a strong word. They have uh, eye spot for kind of visual sensory but it is not on the same complex level as our eyes or um, many more um, advanced invertebrates and uh, vertebrates. So. Definitely, awesome, yeah. I agree. So I think those are all of the questions, um, but if you have any more, again, please feel free to email us and thank you so much for everyone joining and letting us Wait. know that it was really interesting Taylor, and informative. I have a quiz. Why? Are you, why oh. For my quiz. Okay. Oh, everyone, my hold on for the Sorry, quiz. Everyone. All right, so real fast, we're going to go through a, a fun little quick quiz just to see if you uh, um, were paying attention. Um, you can throw your answers in the chat. You can shout your answers to your spouse or your dog. You know, this is just mainly for you. All right, so what is this organism? And do you know what the horseshoe or clover shaped is used for? For those of you who put moon jelly and reproductive organ uh, organs, good job. Next, are these two animals in the same phylum? No, so one is a sponge on the left, the red boring sponge, and then on the right is the zoanthid, which is a cnidarian. All right, so what's the common name? of this organism. And do you remember what the names of the four polyps were or what they're used for? All right, so this is the Portuguese man o' war and you have the gas-filled flow, metaphor, the digestive polyp, the reproductive polyp, and then like we like to say, the stinging bits. All right. 
Can you name this? And is it a Nidarian? So this is a comb jelly or a tinafore, and it is not a Nidarian because it doesn't have nidocytes or those stinging cells. All right. Now, do you remember the name of this sponge and then why it's important to humans? All right, so this is the red pore rope sponge and it's important for biomedical research with those, um, with helping with HIV. All right. So what animal is this and how do they get their nutrients? This is the corkscrew anemone and they do it by actively feeding and they um, do photosynthesis. All right. So what is this? And can you touch them? This is fire coral. And no, don't touch them. That's a very bad idea. I think this is our last question. Are these guys flatworms? And the one on the right is a flatworm, but the one on the left is actually a nudibranch. And you can tell because of that crown shaped naked gills on the back and their extended rhinophores on the front. And again, Mauricio is going to talk a little bit more about nudibranchs in his presentation on April 12th. Oh, just kidding. There's more. All right. So what is this organism? And do you remember what the name of the study of sponges is? All right. So this is the giant barrel sponge. And the study of sponges is spongiology, which is just still so much fun to say. All right, so with that, thank you so much for tuning into our webinar. Um, as Taylor said, if you have any questions, feel free to email them to us. Um, if you would like to get involved in the future, check out um, cfan.net, which stands for Southeast, Southeast Florida Action Network. And this is our DEP citizen science monitoring and reporting system for sections of Florida's coral reef that send, again, from St. Lucie Inlet down through uh, Miami-Dade County. And that, uh, at that site, you can learn about how you can become more involved.